Kia ora koutou, do not adjust your set. It is Stephanie here bringing you the most important three minute board games related list of the year. It's the Tefi 25 for 2020. This list is quite different to last year's and I think that mostly reflects what an absolute 2020 has been. We've had limited opportunities to play games in general. Though thankfully, New Zealand did go hard and go early, and we've managed to get back to the point that seeing people outside our bubbles, and even proper sit-down board game conventions, are doable. Still, it's fair to say that all plague-related games took a bit of a hammering in my esteem. That being said... Pandemic itself remains a pretty classic game and even got some play when my co-workers convinced me to bring it in during a quiet period, and we won, which was very heartening. But this year's list is lighter, fluffier, more immersive. There are games on here that I simply think are really, 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 really good looking, and that's fine, because it's my subjective opinion, and my subjective opinion is biased, skewed, irrational, and probably wrong. But I know that having said that, and having read all of the comments on some of Jay's top 100 lists, that's not going to stop people from saying, wow, this list is so rubbish, how can number one not be blah? I probably haven't played blah, and it's probably not obsession. Spoilers. But that's just the way these lists go, and that's the way the comments go, so I just want to say in advance, don't flame those commenters, make this a nice, happy, positive space. Don't even just comment with the timestamp of me saying this is my subjective and wrong opinion, because, you know, they clearly don't want to watch the video. Just comment with the word of the day. Chipotle. And finally, before we get rolling, I have to thank Pub Meeple's game ranking engine, link will be in the description, which makes this whole process so much easier than it would otherwise be. And also all of our amazing patrons on Patreon, who literally keep this channel going. You're all pretty awesome people. Spirit Island is an anti-colonial co-op game in which players are the spirits of the land, defending their mushroom people from terrifying destructive colonizers. It's challenging and pretty much endlessly replayable given the variety of spirits and powers on offer. And it's so satisfying when your plans come together. A bit of a drop on last year's rankings, mainly because this one hasn't made it off the shelf. Android is a proper cyberpunk murder mystery overlaid with grand conspiracy and personal drama. Unfortunately, we have neither the time nor the professional comment moderation team necessary for me to go into my true feelings about the cyberpunk genre, but when it's done well, it's great. It's a beautiful classic and will always have a place on our shelf. There is little as escapist as immersing yourself in the struggles of a humble gardener trying to stop the Emperor's prized panda eating all the damn bamboo. Takenoko is sweet, simple, and very well put together. Panda, 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 panda! Some might say Bananagram slipped in the rankings this year is down to the fact my stepsister has thrashed me at it the last two times we've played, but I couldn't possibly comment on that kind of unfair speculation. It is still the fast-moving, scrabble-soloing anagram game, and I love it, even if there is a challenger to my throne. And while we're here, I have to give a shout-out to Ketos, the word-building card game that officially ruins family dinners per its latest Kickstarter update. It is available for retail in New Zealand, and hopefully soon Australia, the UK, and the Philippines. Sorry, the rest of the world once the Americans have to miss out on something. Um, and it is the only game that my word nerdy family loves as much, if not more, than Bananagrams. I know I'm very late to the party on this. Yes, that is a pun on the expansion. But Sushi Go is a charming, quick, easy and strategic card collection game, featuring extremely delightful artwork and pudding. I did a whole three minute review of it earlier this year, so go check that out. Do I like this game? I think I like this game. 
It certainly provided one of the most thrilling, heart-pounding gaming experiences of my year. It's not just that you're on a timer, everyone is on a timer, and you have to pick everything up with tweezers while trying to save people's lives. Is it fun? I don't know if it's fun, but I want to play it again. The medical theme gives it a lot more weight and urgency than its predecessor, Kitchen Rush. And while it might seem a little on the nose for the year we've had, you're focused down in the detail of curing the patient right in front of you. And you don't check if they have insurance first. This is one of the really, really pretty ones. With a capacity for sniping and undercutting your competitors that I assume reflects the reality of the art trade. In Atelier, you're creating works of art in your studio, managing money, student recruitment, attracting rich patrons, and paint storage. The artworks themselves are gorgeously reproduced on tarot-sized cards, and presumably, for licensing reasons, they are all pieces held in American galleries, so it avoids feeling cliched by just copying the ten famous works of art everyone already owns on a tea towel. Who's She placed second on the list last year, but I decided to take it off for 2020, because let's be honest, Guess Who is not my favourite game, or even my second favourite, and my reasons for loving Who's She are less about it as a game and it as a piece of art, a statement about who and what we value, and owning it as a statement about what games can be and who makes them for what audience. And no! I wouldn't mind an apology from everyone who commented on last year's video complaining that I said JK Rowling was transphobic, because boy did that ship sail. Another for the aesthetic appreciation crowd, Parks is a gorgeous game that has you hiking randomised trails, collecting vivid personal experiences and photos, and competing to be the best travelled hiker of them all. It's a simple setup and an easy play. And at a time when hitting the great outdoors isn't exactly available to all of us, a nice distraction. I just need a New Zealand version, okay? Doc? Forest and Bird? Make it happen? Le Havre is a game that gets a big jump this year, based on how often it's hit the table. And I promise, my three minute review of it is coming. Any day now. Collect resources as your boat sails the market canal, dominate value-added industry, ship products for maximum profit. With very limited actions each turn, it's really amazing how quickly it accelerates and how critical your early decisions become. But it's also easy to pick up because of those limited decision points. Speaking of worker placement mechanics in a harbour town... Smooth segue, Stephanie. Very smooth. Lords of Waterdeep also took a big jump for me this year. And I promise it's not just because we went to a games day at a friend's place and I won a six-player game in which the other five players were all men, three of whom are published or soon-to-be-published board game designers. But it probably helped! Something clearly clicked in my brain between the first time I played Lords of Waterdeep, however many years ago, and now, and I think it's an interesting lesson in revisiting games that didn't gel or quite fit right the first time you played them, especially as you play more and get more experienced picking up different mechanics. Apparently there's a version of this that doesn't feature adorable golem art, so I'm not sure entirely what the point is. Gather crystals, collect cards to change those crystals into other crystals, trade in crystals for amazing golems and you'll hardly notice it's an engine building game. The artwork is gorgeous, the crystals are really satisfying to play with, and apparently this was way down on my list last year, so I can only apologise. So I said this wasn't a year for dwelling on the terrible things happening in the world, but a game about coming together, despite great personal risk, to assassinate Hitler while struggling with how far you'll let him go before you can take action is always welcome. And when your fifth backup plan finally works, it is so gratifying. That being said, this subject matter is not going to be a fun time for everyone, so have some care for your fellow gamers. The game that's reinvented trick-taking, and wow that feels long overdue. 
My only quibble is that as a seasoned 500 player, I frequently have to override my own instincts. And sometimes I don't. The theme is also quite superfluous, but the rounds go so quickly and the hidden hand co-op tension is so spicy, you just don't mind. It's not alien, but who's counting? It captures all the horrid tension of being trapped in a can as your crew dies one by one, except the killer is a giant acid-spitting xenomorph and there's no emergency meeting button. That's an Among Us reference for the Twitch kids. Except also, maybe one of your crewmates is trying to kill you all? The best thing for it might be to sabotage all the other life pods and save yourself. One of the best movies of all time is now a fantastic 2-4 player game of cat, mouse, and biting innocent swimmers. One of you plays the shark, and the rest of you plays the finest cast of very, very tanned white men ever assembled by a 27-year-old ingenue director. 27. What am I doing with my life? The style is wonderfully retro, the hidden movement is more flexible than it looks at first glance, and the two phases of the game keep the tension ratcheting up. The absurdly simple and devilishly complex tower building puzzle game with infinite variation thanks to its god cards will just keep pulling people in who can't believe it's not really as simple as it first looks. It can also provide a unique centerpiece for your ethically responsible, socially isolated Christmas dinner. This one has had a bump largely due to playing other Legendary Encounters games and finding them wanting. The theme, pace and enemies simply works a lot better with the alien setting. And I'm a complete sucker for the alien setting. I even liked Prometheus. This one's not going to budge for a while, even though it doesn't get nearly as much play as it used to. The characters are too beloved, the stakes are too intense, the betrayal mechanic doesn't feel as unearned or catastrophic as it can be in other games. So say we all. For some reason, I didn't really rate this last year, but Horrified is now one of the favourites in the 3 Minute Board Games household. You're a band of unexpected heroes coming together to rid your quaint Hollywood backlot town of not one, but multiple classic horror monsters, each with their own very specific weakness. To be honest, it feels like a cleaner, more satisfying version of what Arkham Horror 3rd Edition tried to be. The monster theme is really fun, even if some of the mechanics are a bit pasted on, and it's an intellectual property that pretty much anyone with a passing acquaintance to Hollywood horror can connect to. For some reason, it took a while for Jay to convince me on this one, even with the big tree and the squishy berries. Squishy! Everdell is a worker placement tableau building game, where the adorable animal townspeople and their adorable little houses paid for in twigs and pebbles hide an incredibly complex system of resource management and decision making. I also thoroughly recommend the Pearlbrook expansion, which adds a whole new element of froggy ambassadors and shiny pearls. It would be number one if this were my mother's list, because she is still destroying all comers at this game, to the extent her own household will not play it with her any longer, which means I have to. It ties together a great theme and simple but effective mechanics, cutthroat strategy, and many opportunities to lament that your sister has stolen your bonnet. AGAIN. I'm always a little cagey about reductive statements like, this is the perfect game for people who aren't really into board games but love Jane Austen. Except I've had a lot of feedback from people who've gotten their friends or partners into gaming through marrying Mr. Darcy that it's a pretty good game for people who aren't into board gaming but really love Jane Austen. Before we roll on to the top five, I'd like to give a shout out to a category of games we don't often mention on the channel and two games from within that category, one of which was new to me this year and the other I'd played a long time ago but got a chance to revisit. For the Queen and I, Dark Overlord, each give the players prompt cards to inspire them to create a story together in one as the retinue of the queen of a land that has been in war for a long time, and in the other as a pack of disreputable underlings trying to throw each other under the bus. 
For the Queen has simply gorgeous artwork and offers a huge amount of freedom to the extent some people might argue it's not really a board game, but it's on Board Game Geek and Board Game Atlas, ergo board game. But I Dark Overlord has the edge for me. The setup has a bit more inherent conflict to it, you already have something you want to get out of it and it's not to die. And also I'm very, very, very good at it. I have lost games of I Dark Overlord because I was so entertaining to listen to that the Dark Overlord just kept me on the spot until I ran out of cards. It's probably a little upsetting to have the revelation that your true purpose in life is to be a sniveling goblin, but there you go. A great one for a party with the right kind of people. You definitely need to be a bit more extroverted performers rather than deep thinkers. What am I saying about myself? Of all the Cthulhu Mythos related games, this remains my firm favourite, even if I did rediscover the Elder Sign app this year as a great commute buster. Familiarity is a huge part of it, but the massive scope and the fact that it's always tense, even when you've played it hundreds of times, because everything could suddenly come crashing down around you, make it enduring and always replayable. The usual disclaimers about Lovecraft's inherent racism and xenophobia do still apply. And yes, I will still only play Daisy. We haven't broken out our copy of Summer Pavilion to see if it matches the original, but Azul Classic is still getting a lot of play in this house. It has the perfect balance of building your own thing while messing with other people's things. The quality of the pieces is super pleasing, and it hits you right in the jigsaw, sudoku, or logic puzzle zone. The Pandemic Destroyer itself holds strong this year, with the classic game's tightly paced cooperative strategy and global crises elevated by the Thunderbird's mix of heavy nostalgia, retro vibes, and razor-thin balance between tension and charm. This is one that I am literally always in the mood to play. The game isn't easy to find, and the Tracy Island expansion, which refines a few play elements, is even more difficult to source, but well worth the effort. Strap in for some politics, kids! Block by Block remains a terribly relevant game in the year of our Lord 2020, when it feels like we've never needed to understand more that solidarity and cooperation against oppressive forces, structural and immediate white supremacy, is the only way we're going to survive. Somehow, reducing that all down to coloured cubes occupying city blocks and making the hard decisions to work for each other as well as towards a collective goal is... soothing? Block by Block takes four factions and pits them together against a much more powerful mobile police force, with only limited time to achieve some pretty big goals before the military gets sent in. It's tough, it's tense, and it's a great teaching tool, especially in the semi-co-op mode. It is very political. All war games are political. Do I really need to explain? I mean, what else can I say? Have I not said enough? Didn't I do this exact joke last year? Obsession is one of our 3 minute board games gold medal games with good reason. It's absolutely crunchy enough for any board gamer to feel like they've had a proper challenge, but the theme and how perfectly that theme connects to the mechanics of worker placement and resource management makes it incredibly accessible for a less crunchy audience. The second edition, which you may be aware I quite liked, came out this year and includes some quality of life improvements and even more beautiful components. The Upstairs Downstairs expansion provides more custom meeples. I mean, A++, 10 out of 10, will rave about again. Well that concludes the Tefi 25 for 2020. Don't say that 10 times fast, it's quite difficult and you might get confused and fall down. I did. If you enjoyed the video, you know what you gotta do. Like it, subscribe to the channel, and come support us on Patreon so I feel the social pressure to do it all again next year. Until the next time I see you, I'm Stephanie, this has been 3 Minute Board Games. Kakite ano. Squishy! Squishy, squish, squish, squish. Squish.